Okay, friends, um, today's billing was supposed to be uh, Mr. Vito Baldini, whom we know and love. Uh, he, however, is currently being afflicted with the seven plagues and is uh, very ill and therefore unable to be with us. Uh, this was a late call, and so uh, you were going to be stuck with me, which would have been interesting, uh, but uh, I, was, I uh, managed to uh, do a little networking, and uh, a good friend of Liberty Communion, uh, Pastor John Alexander, who actually pastored one of the Liberty Churches, Riverwards, for 13 years, was more than happy to step in last minute. And uh, because of the, the last minute nature of this, um, we also invited uh, John to pick his own passage. And so he has. Uh, the one in your bulletin is not the correct one, although certainly worth your time. Um, he will be preaching from Psalm 90. And uh, so if you don't have a Bible, you can simply listen and enjoy um, what he has for us today. So thank you, John. Thanks, Sam. Or... In addition to, if you have your Bible, uh, hey, I see some folks I know over there. Uh, uh, if you have a Bible, you could turn to Psalm 90, uh, but also if you just have, you know, a device of some kind. Uh, I'm going to read from the ESV, but uh, I think sometimes you all use the uh, NRSV. Uh, it's not too different. I looked this morning. While you're turning there, um, yeah, I was at Liberty River Words for a long time, and I came, I came out here near the beginning, so if you recognize me, but I've somehow forgotten your name, please forgive me. I've, um, I've been out here a lot. I think of the different spaces you were in at Rosemont College over the years, and even once at Liberty Newtown Square when there were a precious five of you. And, you know, it, you know, it was the season. We were online. We were online. But I think it was maybe one of the first or second Sundays that we were just trying to ease back. We were in the same space out at Riverwards, just trying to ease back into in-person gatherings. So I didn't see many of you that time. But it's, it's great to be here, um, last minute as it was. I am um, now actually working as a counselor at a, an organization that's partnered with Liberty Mainline a number of times over the years. It's called Philadelphia Renewal Network. It's based in the Fairmount neighborhood, but has had some satellite offices. So um, part of my work is working with them as a therapist. Part of my work is actually networking with churches uh, like yours. So... Um, if you or someone you know is ever uh, in need of counseling, individual, marital, um, also psychiatric services, uh, it was founded by a psychiatrist uh, in our presbytery in Philadelphia, um, seminars on various issues that uh, are at the intersection of faith and mental health. Feel free to talk to me afterwards, and there's also uh, some, some, some pamphlets I left out there at the table. Um, Psalm 90, if you have it, if you don't, here we go. You all beat me there, actually. A prayer of Moses, our one and only psalm attributed to Moses, or in the tradition of Moses somehow. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long have pity on your servants, Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years 
as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, In my last year, 2023, of um, pastoral ministry, in the sense of being the lead pastor of a church, I performed two funerals. Sometimes there's been more, sometimes none. Um, But the year was kind of bookended. In February, I did a funeral for a little girl. But I think of it as at the beginning of the year, because the beginning of the year is when, like, the writing was on the wall. It was really, it was really, really um, a rough first few weeks and months um, for her. Her name was Leah. And then... At the end of the year, um, it was actually I, after I had stepped aside from my pastoral role at Liberty, I did a funeral for an old man. And um, in a lot of ways, they were strikingly similar for a little girl and an old man. Obviously, the stories told were, were different. Both of them had loved ones present. Both of them... Both of the services, as you can imagine, there was speaking and singing and praying uh, about the meaning of a human life, about the things in a human life, even as short as Leah's was, the things in a human life that last and the things in a human life that do not. Overwhelmingly similar. But this is a psalm that I was thinking of then, at the beginning of last year, a lot. Because it's a psalm about endings. It's also a psalm about things that never change. Things that never change and things that do. As I mentioned, this is a psalm of Moses, before I begin reading. This, that means that this is one of the oldest songs recorded in a Bible full of songs and prayers. You know that... Um, The Psalms aren't the only songs recording in Scripture. Moses, who uh, edited or wrote um, or passed on to his earliest disciples uh, the the bulk of the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, it's packed with songs and psalms, um, even though it's not in the book of Psalms. So think of this psalm as back there in that tradition of the earliest things. And it's right there in the first few verses. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth. This is creation language. Before the mountains were brought forth. Or ever you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting. You are God. You know, for the children. For the old men and women. Everlasting to everlasting. It's a good psalm for the beginning of a year. And the two points I'm going to give you are... The flow of the psalm, straight out of the flow of the psalm. This is a psalm about the things that do not last. And it's a psalm about the things that totally last. From everlasting to everlasting. So think about it in terms of the bad news and the good news. The first 11 verses are bad news, stuff that doesn't last. The last verses are about really, really good news, stuff that does. So the bad news and the good news. First, the bad news. Again, let me read again the first three verses. Again, um, the two halves of the psalm contrast an eternal God with temporal human beings. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of God. Of man. The voice of God saying, Return to dust. This is language of Genesis 3. After the fall of humanity, the reality of physical and spiritual death, which are absolutely linked, life can only be sustained through communion of God, uh, communion with God. So, so whether that last breath is now or in 80 years, death has entered where communion is fractured. But it's also, if you know the early books of the Bible, it's also reminding us of Genesis 2, 
where the human being is created. In very mysterious language, we're told that a human, you know what a human being is made of? Dust and the breath of God. Earth and heaven. Heaven and earth. That's what a human being is. Essentially, both. They can be separated. They will be brought back together. Always both. The voice of God saying, return to dust, means that tragic never wanted it to be so separation is reality now, folks. And there's no use being naive about it amidst all of our resolutions. You know, the, the, the church community is a community. It's a family of hope, but never naive hope. Never fantasy, ever. If it's fantasy, let's get rid of it. It's not going to help. We're made of dust and the breath of God, and in the reality of sin, God says, return to dust. The next few verses illustrate the point. Still, if you have the text in front of you, or just listen closely, this is verse 4 and following. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. You may have heard this phrase before. You might not have known that it was in this uh, passage. In God's sight, a thousand years are as yesterday. Actually, it's not just here. The Apostle Peter, in his second epistle, quotes this verse. So it's in both of our testaments. A thousand years are like yesterday to God. If you could think for a second about the last thousand years, I think this is a helpful exercise for all of us. A thousand years ago, it was the year 1024. So just think of the last 1,000 years as one day for a moment. And think of all that's happened in the last 1,000 years that are as one day. Like a lot of stuff, a lot of development, a lot of scientific advancement, a lot of tears, a lot of joy, a lot of expansion. We crack through the atmosphere somehow and go looking for God up in the cosmos. Except for that's not where you find him. He's on heaven and earth. If you go to heaven looking for him apart from earth, you're not going to find him there if you don't find him on earth as well. Think about this. The existence of the United States as a sovereign nation are like six hours of that one day. If a thousand years is one day. The U.S. as a nation is six hours. My life, I turn 42 next week. One minute. I'm sorry, an hour. <laughs> I wrote down an hour. I said a minute. It's short, though. <laughs> 42 years is one hour of that 24 hours in the day that is a thousand years to God. And yeah, it's poetry, but it's meant to let your mind and heart go on a little bit of a journey. That's what poetry does for you. And already at 42, certain things are fading. I can't play wiffle ball in the yard with my kids without coming away with a limp. I can tell you that story a little bit later, but I learned that painfully a couple weeks ago. And this psalm encourage us, encourages us to believe that it's important to remember that it's short. I know it's a downer, but it's actually really, really useful because you could miss your life. You could miss your life. No naivete, no fantasy, reality, not hopeless reality, but sobering reality. You could miss your life. It's short. There's also a sense in this psalm, a reminder in this psalm, that life wasn't supposed to be short. I'm down in verses 8 and 9 now, if you're following. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. And that sigh language isn't an accident. He's still playing on breath. The breath that goes somewhere and the body that goes somewhere. The separation that was never meant to be. The sigh. The scriptures testify that all sin leads to death. Human sin has cut life short. Because again, sin cuts us off from communion with God, which is life itself. And you know, there's this... Um, I told this story a number of times because it was so powerful to me and I re revisited it this year in the funerals that I officiated. Um, about 10 years ago, 
in our neighborhood, there was this really loud shriek across the street in the middle of the night, which you never want to hear, but it's, you know, it's creepy wherever you live. But in the city, you know, row homes, it just echoes back and forth. And um, ambulances came. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't feel like going outside. Um, I don't know why we didn't go outside, but we did. And the next morning, we found out that it was the very, very old neighbor across the street whose wife, you know, was laying next to him in bed, and it was... He was the one who had died in the middle of the night, and she found him in the night. He had died, and she screamed, and I swear I said this. Oh, is that all? <laughs> is that all? Like, I just forgot that every time it's a tragedy. Like, every time it's an outrage. Every single time. It's not the way it's supposed to be. We're left with verse 10. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Seven, I mean, that's a, creepy, that's a creepy thing to think about for some of us. Years of our life are 70, by reason of strength, 80. And we had newborns in our church in Liberty River Wards, and we had a man who was 91, and he was strong. And we used to read this together. He's actually the one that used to bring it to me. And uh, the old man's funeral that I did this year, who's actually my father, um, he made it five weeks shy of 80. He was 79 and uh, 46 weeks, something like that. Not the way it's supposed to be. And yet here we are. These are undisputed facts. Nobody's saying here in this room, that's not true, that things don't last forever. It's undisputed. These are bad news facts. Good news is coming. But first, the final thing I'll say on the bad news is there's this hinge verse, which is not undisputed. This is actually something that you need to be convinced of. It's not my job to convince you, but here these old words from Moses are in black and white, and I'll ask if you believe them. Verse 12. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Now, that's a prayer, but there's an assumption in here. That it is a wise thing to number your days. I don't know if you believe that. It's a wise, is there wisdom in knowing your end? Again, yes, because it impacts how you spend your life. This is another interesting exercise. Um, have you ever looked at a family tree? <laughs> Or filled one in. Maybe you're a, you know, an Ancestry.com person. How many names do you know once you go past grandparents? Great-grandparents. Great-great-grandparents. I got to tell you, I don't know one name of any of my great-grandparents. Not one. The rest of the psalm actually suggests that it's okay if your great-great-grandchildren don't know your name. They're probably not going to. And if I don't read this psalm at the beginning of the year, I just, I just might begin building my life like I'm supposed to be Achilles or something who's going to somehow live on through people remembering my name. That's not the way you're supposed to live. How are you supposed to live? This is the good news. The rest is good news. <laughs> the rest is good news. The good news starts with the fact that God is not only a righteous judge, he also is a steadfast lover. That's where the good news starts. Right after verse 12, teach us the number of our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us. Satisfy us. We, the creatures who are made up of dust and the breath of God, satisfy us. It's possible for us to be satisfied knowing that our great-great-grandchildren will not know our name. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. If you're not familiar, steadfast love... That's actually a technical phrase. Those words shouldn't be separated when we translate them. Some of your translations might have loving kindness or just simply mercy. 
But in the ESV, steadfast love is the translation of the Hebrew chesed, which is a term for the promise-keeping love of God that he binds himself to by blood oath. Specifically, God's promise not to utterly abandon his people. There's a fascinating passage in the last book of the Bible, Revelation 13, verse 8, where it says, Before the foundation of the world, it was written that the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, would be slain. It's a fascinating verse. That means there was already a promise that evil would be crushed, that death would be a defeated enemy before it became a problem for us, before death entered. The very end of this psalm, I think, is pretty famous. You may be familiar with it. Let the favor or beauty or grace, as some translations put it, let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Establish the work of our hands. It says it twice, believe it or not. That means it's important. If it says it twice, establish the work of our hands. Moses is saying, even though everything in verses 1 through 12 is true, that we are returning to dust, we expectantly await your grace. Because you're not just a righteous judge, you're also the gracious rescuer, and you always have been. We can live in the reality that although death still is a thing, it is a defeated enemy that no longer inhibits communion with God through Jesus Christ. There is an expectation at the end of this psalm that you can actually put your hand to something in this life that will last forever, that will be doubly established, Moses is saying, doubly established beyond your time and will matter forever with God. Jesus Christ talked this way. Do you remember when Jesus said to his disciples, if you give someone a cup of cold water in my name, you will by no means, in Greek, never, no, never, lose your reward. What's he talking about? That kid's going to be thirsty again when you give him a little cup of water. What does that matter? Because there's a way of living into God's story that connects so deeply with what you were for from the beginning and what you will be at the end that it is an eternal participation that you experience now. I can't untangle the mystery of that for you, but it's a promise from the Savior. If you live in light of God's story now, not trying to build your own kingdom that will crumble way sooner than you think, you will never, ever be sorry. And it's the promise of the prophets, the apostles, and the saints. How can I know? How can I know this year if what I am doing is with and for the king and can last? How do I know if I'm putting my hand to a plow that I will not regret in 80 years, if not by the end of this year? How can you know? There's a taste test here that I can't answer for you. I mean, this is wisdom literature too. This isn't necessarily something that you can solve like a science problem, but I'll give you a few of the taste tests and you can tell me or you can talk to one another about whether they fit. And I think the wisdom comes right out of the psalm. I find that if you ask just a few why questions that are answered honestly, you will arrive at some wisdom of this for your life. For example, why am I focused on this job so much? And why am I so terrified of losing it, as the case may be? Why am I so, so devoted, maybe even in an enslaved way, to this job? If the answer that com comes back is something like, because I want to protect myself from any kind of discomfort, and I want to have as much as I possibly can, you may be building dust. You may be building dust. If the answer lands anywhere in what you're doing with your life, if your answer ever lands anywhere close to, I am building something that will certainly rust or can be stolen, you may be living a tragedy. It's okay. He loves you. If he loves you this much, it's okay to admit that. 
That's why the psalm exists in the first place, by the way, so that you can turn from that to something that can be established. Or what about this one? Is your spiritual life a desert or your family life because you simply don't feel like you have the time or capacity or the desire to tend to it. Numbering your days could be a wonderful means of grace for you. Listen, if this isn't fantasy, if what we're doing here is not the emotional fantasy of people who have to get ready to get rid of everything they love when they die, so they invent something called Christianity so it'll hurt a little bit less, Let's just say right now, we don't want anything to do with it. But on the other hand, on the other hand, if death is no separator from communion with God, if that's true, and all that happens when we die is we pass through death into a hug that continues but only gets tighter and better, then what do we possibly have to lose by numbering our days and saying, how can I live into incarnate love now? And how can I stop not doing that? It's a means of grace. It always has been from the beginning. And I think it's lost. Remembrance of death. It helps you cling to him. Listen, if anxiety is racking your life, there might be a thousand reasons for it. I would not deign to tell you individually or corporately why that's happening. It's too complex. You're too much of a mystery. But I will you tell, to tell you something that is always necessary to live a healthy spiritual life and is at the root of a lot of my personal anxieties. Simply clinging, clinging to something that is completely contrary to my nature. You know what a human being is for? A human being is for clinging to God who is the one who clings to my life, and as I let go of what I cling to and cling to him and let him cling to my life, paradoxically, that is exactly at the place where my life returns to me. That's how you live. That is how your days are established. I mean, how many times did Jesus talk this way? If you want a great plan to lose your life, just try to save it. If you really, really want to do a great job at destroying your life, make sure that no discomfort ever touches you. Make sure that you protect everything that you don't want to lose as long as you possibly can. That's exactly how you can be positive to have the greatest tears on the last day. Or <laughs> you can let him hold the things that only he was ever meant to hold to and you know what you get to do? You get to only hold on to him. You get to only hold on to him. You get to be a human being. It's awesome. And I got the feeling there's some people in this room who can testify to that because you know the other way. And it's not a little difference. It's life and death. It's communion and, and death. And we know which one we're made for. Let me just end with a story. I think I've said enough. If in Christ, faith working through love, that's how the Apostle Paul puts it, the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. It's, an, it's another way of describing what Moses is getting at here. My wife had an uncle, 10th of 11 kids, and he was schizophrenic. And he uh, lived a little bit with the family as much as he could. They tried their best, but by his 30s, he was in group homes. And life was a roller coaster. Even like personal uh, hygiene slipped uh, constantly. It was hard to get in the car with him. Um, but there was something about the guy. There was something that was about no compromise, that whenever the name of Jesus came up, his eyes lit up. Whenever he had something that was precious to him, he wanted to share it. You know, it wasn't like giving away everything he had, but he just wanted to share it. He wanted to be in communion with God and others. And externally, his life was can't stay clean, can't get showered, can't live on his own. We have to go find him sometimes because he escapes from his residential home. Um, we, 
we have, we have to keep chasing this guy just, just to help him be like a normal, functioning human being. Then his funeral comes. He had a heart attack. He died at 50. And the family goes. This is, this is how you live. The family goes to the funeral. And he's surrounded by about 15 other people he lived in this community home with. And the family, the family only has sad stories. Only has sad stories. You know what kind of stories the other people in the community home had? He prayed for me every day. He never let me eat dinner alone. He gave me stuff I didn't want. <laughs> but he gave it to me. And it mattered to him. He told me about his day. He invited me to his favorite restaurant that we walked to five miles away. <laughs> he, uh, he always wanted to know about my family. The family only had sad stories. The family got it wrong. We're getting it wrong. What counts in the kingdom is faith expressing itself through love. Brothers and sisters, is there one thing, one thing you could do today to let go of your life without context? That sounds like a nightmarish thing for a pastor to say. But in context, it's only so you can take hold of the lover of your souls. He'll hold it for you. And it'll return to you. Will you take your hands off your life a little bit so you can put your hands on him and his promises? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.